Well, I won't add my welcome. You've been welcomed by many. My name is Ricky Burdett, and with Philip Rode, I run LSE Cities and the Urban Age Project. So my job is to do a couple of very practical things and then uh, help set the context of the discussions in these two days. Uh, the practical things are to do uh, with turning off your mobile phones, please. Very, very important. Um, the second thing is that you've been given this badge which has got a USB on it, that has all the material which is actually in the newspaper and the research reports, so if you're interested, hold on to it. Don't give it to anybody else. Um, the third thing is that actually for the first time ever uh, with Ute Vilan, we have decided to actually make this conference live on a web podcast. So that's actually happening now. So rather than just 150 people in the room, we may have thousands, we don't know, so bear that in mind. Um, and um, I'm now going to spend a little bit of time saying how we're organizing these two days, uh, but just looking at the statistics in many ways in front of you now, you do get a sense that this is genuinely a global event. Uh, we have people from four continents, from a very large number of cities around the world, some of which are actually mentioned there. The urban age discussions are about that, they're discussions. We try to not just have presentations with an audience. That's the whole idea. That's why we're sitting this way. Uh, some will make presentations from here and then sit down, uh, and we encourage that discussion. And the reason you all have a microphone is for you to actually contribute, and, and uh, we encourage that throughout the two days. In order to make that happen, we've asked all the speakers to stick to pretty strict time limits. Uh, and we're going to be uh, radical in our asking the speakers or reminding them that they've got five minutes left, two minutes left, one minute left, or stop. And unfortunately, that's going to be my role. Uh, so I'm apologizing uh, already. Uh, I, the secretary is already smiling. Well, I, I'm sure we'll be lenient. Um, but that is important in the dynamics of the event, and I stress that we do want you, when someone has said something at the end of their uh, talk, uh, put up your hand, look at uh, whoever is chairing that session, and myself and my colleagues at the top, and try and uh, attract our attention, or just intervene and just tell us what you, you think. The whole point here is not to make long speeches, but to say what has been said, how does that trigger, how does that reflect in terms of your own experiences, very much focusing on the issues of health, well-being, and city form. Now, that takes me to really the next um, set of information before I give an introduction in terms of the themes. You will have all had, I hope, uh, a copy of this conference newspaper. The Urban Age, since the very beginning when we started in 2005, 2006, believed that in some cases, you know, showing an image says more about the city than too many texts. This time we've had to compromise because not only here are we presenting a lot of new research, which I will in fact talk about a bit later in the program, uh, we've also asked a number of colleagues from around the world uh, to contribute to the health and well-being debate. And in fact, we felt it got a bit tight, so we produced another document, which you have, which is nearly 20 other essays, uh, all of which, by the way, are available online and uh, not. So you have two documents here. The research, as I stress, which has been run by my uh, colleague Mifanwi Taylor and others who are here in the room, is also illustrated in here. So many of the graphs, many of the documentation, which I will be talking about, you can find there. So that's an important sort of resource uh, for you. Now, in terms of the program, you'll have this green document here. Th this is effectively the program for our two days. Um, there will be one or two slight changes with people who um, are either unable to come at the last moment uh, or one or two switches because of uh, laryngitis or other issues of that sort. I, I'm looking at you, Victor. Can you speak? He's fine. Right, okay. Otherwise, we're going to call a doctor, which there are many in the room, but that's not going to be necessary. But there'll be one or two switches, and I'll make those announcements um, as we go through the day. But I think the, the thing to remember is that we have the program, please keep on checking it. We will try and keep very much to the time. We have a number of breaks, as you know, in terms of the uh, coffee and lunch, and we aim to end today at around 5.30 or so and tomorrow at 5. So that is the program. We encourage everyone to be present all the time. 
Uh, I know you're all busy and have other things to do, but it actually does create that dialogue that we're talking about. Very important in terms of the space, this, you know, we're interested in form and cities and space. If you come back after coffee and others have left, just bring your name tag and go and sit where there's an empty place at the front. Just come in, make it compact, make it dense, and make it uh, integrated. So uh, please use this room as a place for discussion. So don't wait for someone who you think might be more important than you to come in a few hours' time. If they come late, they can sit uh, somewhere else. That's not a, uh, a problem. So that's very, very important in the way we organize uh, the space. I've already talked about the extra essays, so let me come very quickly to uh, the content of this conference and the content of the research uh, that we've done over the last year with my colleagues here uh, at the LSE, but also colleagues at HKU, and interestingly and importantly, in different departments, both in the Department of Social Sciences, but the Department of Architecture, uh, and uh, departments of medicine, nursing, etc. So it has been a sort of integrated approach between all of us. So where does this start? Perhaps we can take the lights down a little bit so we can look at the slides. Can the lights come down at the front? Is that possible? Not on me, but on the, there, it's better. Can we do that? Is anyone able to do that? Jens, Antoine, can we have the lights down? Is that possible? We can see the slides. Yeah, can you see the slides? Anyway, the point, this is the starting point. Uh, London in the mid 19th century, like Paris, like Berlin, like Barcelona, like Madrid, was experiencing exactly what is happening now in so many Asian or African or Latin American countries. Dramatic expansion in terms of population with incredibly negative effects in terms of the quality of life and the health of people living there. London in the mid 19th century, the average age was something like 30, 32 years old for a man, incredibly low for only a, a century and a half ago. Uh, death was something which was in front of the eyes of most urban dwellers who swelled the populations looking for jobs. These are issues which of course resonate with the problems of the cities today. And we could say that that's where uh, new modern planning actually started. That health was the generator, was the kickstart uh, in terms of what actually happened to the shape of, no, no, that was good. Down with the lights, yeah, down with it. Keep the lights down, please. That was very uh, significant in terms of what actually happened uh, to the shape of the city because in order to resolve these problems, the cities were actually transformed. Why were they transformed? This is an example uh, of a famous map from the 1850s of one of the cholera outbreaks in London in 1854. And John uh, Snow, who looked at this, one of the first physicians, identified that one water pump in the middle of Soho in London, in fact, in Broad Street, was responsible for the contamination which actually killed hundreds, if not thousands, in that area. So just turning off that pump made a difference to the lives of people there. So that was the beginning, let's call it, of a recognition uh, in terms of what infrastructure means. Now, this is connected, of course, to one of the key themes that we're going to address in this conference, which is one of inequality. Charles Booth, one of the first, let's call it ethnographers, effectively, or chroniclers of um, uh, poverty in cities, mapped the whole of London in different colors. He went to every street and every house and said, where are people living in unacceptable conditions? And you see the colors there on the left. And basically, the darker the color, the bluer or the blacker, the worse conditions they were. Now, as it happens, and I'll come back to this in my later talk, but we will all have to think of this in our own cities, these inequalities still persist today, socially and obviously in terms of health. So what happened? What happened in London, and Tony Travers is an expert on this, is that the first municipal government or the beginning of that actually ended up with the, uh, with, um, the infrastructure of sewers which tried to solve this problem. So the Metropolitan Board of Works, one of the major sort of political and governance actions in London, began to transform, and as you can see here with the black lines, create the veins of sanitation under and across London, making it perhaps the first sort of major metropolis. So you had things like this underground to carry fresh water and take out effluence, and this is what happened above ground. In other words, the relationship between the infrastructure of sanitation, of health, the notion of public health, led to a new form of planning, which is this great Victoria embankment 
Haussmann in Paris, of course, did the same thing. <coughs> Similar things happened in Paris. And I think the issue for us today is what is happening in the contemporary expanding <coughs> city and how does it relate to inequality in society and in health. Very interesting, we found only recently this sign on a street in London in 1927, which in a way says it all. The health of the people is the highest law. If you don't live, there's no need for anything. Inequality, governance, democracy are irrelevant if you don't actually have a chance to survive. This, as I say, led to completely different forms of spatial planning. Ebenezer Howard invented the Garden City movement. How do we get away from the congested city of yesterday and today and think of a garden city of tomorrow? This has led basically to suburbanization. Uh, another man, Le Corbusier, another rather important architect, meant well when he said, let's get rid of half of medieval Paris and do that. Why not? The idea was a good one. Instead of the congested medieval streets with no fresh air, which provided the sort of contamination, you put wonderful towers up in the sky, you open windows on the left and on the right, you have a big garden on the ground, and you create the modern city. And that modern city is, of course, what is shaping most of the cities that we're talking about now. This happens to be Istanbul, this happens to be Shanghai, this happens to be Sao Paulo. I don't need to go on when it comes to Hong Kong. That model, in many ways, is uh, very clear in our minds. So what are the issues today in cities and how are we addressing them? Mumbai is set to become the largest city in the world by 2050, overtaking Tokyo. Today, 50% of the people live without basic sanitations and in slum conditions. So for those living there, the issue of sanitation, as Jorgen Eskimose, who's working in Maputo, will tell us, is this providing better water and some basic form of sanitation is really what it's about. At another level, it can be about this, turning a beach which has been contaminated in a rubbish uh, depot for literally tens of years into this. And in fact, the Deutsche Bank gave this project an important prize uh, a few years ago. Just cleaning up a beach and making it accessible to people means that people living in slums can actually have an open space to walk. So the effects on things like obesity, air, pollution, and quality of life are fundamental. So for us, in looking at cities around the world, we've been observing social inequality. This is an image which is well known to the urban ages here, but it's not a Photoshop. It's a favela in Sao Paulo on the left-hand side, which actually has no water or sanitation, basically. And on the right-hand side is a new development where the people are so wealthy that there's a swimming pool on each terrace. Right? Now, that level of inequality, which I know Richard Sennett spoke about last night at HKU, in terms of the capitalist model, needs to be understood in terms of its health implications. That's what this conference is really about, and that is why the Urban Age has come to Hong Kong to talk about it. So thank you very much for listening, and I ask Detlev Ganten to introduce the first session. Thank you.